Hello cave dwellers, there are many ways of playing the Sega Mega Drive here in the cave. There's the Pioneer Laser Active with its unique Mega Drive games on Laserdisc. There's the Amstrad Mega PC for the British approach of mashing together a PC and a console. Or in the same vein, the IBM Terra Drive for a US and Japanese collaboration. Or maybe you remember playing on the Megatech arcade cabinets, a Mega Drive based arcade that will feature on the channel soon as will the Terra Drive. And I used to play one of these at my local ice rink. But for most of us, it would have been the plain old Mega Drive, or as you cowboys in the US call it, the Genesis, but the Mega Drive for the rest of the world. And while these exotic ways of playing on the Sega Mega Drive were exciting, many of us wouldn't have even been aware of their existence back in the day. We were used to the plain old vanilla Sega Mega Drive console as it came. But over time, that stock Mega Drive itself morphed into something different. A series of wild upgrades appeared in our catalogues and magazines that our common sense told us were ill-conceived, but our hearts told us were lustworthy. Those upgrades were the Mega CD and the 32X. When these upgrades were all cobbled together, the slightly haphazard contraption before you donned the nickname the Tower of Power. It's debatable just how much additional power it actually brought to the party when compared to the competition that was appearing at the time but its objective was to take you slightly closer to the offerings that Sega now had in the arcade as we moved into the 3D era of gaming. If you couldn't have 3D, you were being left behind. And of course, there was that little game that everyone wanted a piece of at the time that PC gamers were enjoying, Doom. History has taught us that this whole upgrade path was poorly thought out, and it conflicted with Sega's own roadmap for their soon-to-be-released Sega Saturn console. It was poorly supported by developers, it was expensive, it was not a commercial success, but for some reason it lives on in our memories as the ultimate Mega Drive setup that we never had. The Christmas that never came. And that's exactly why I want a Tower of Power here in the cave, so that people can come in, sit down in front of it and decide for themselves, did they get off lightly by not getting this for Christmas, by their parents not throwing money at this thing? Or perhaps you actually did get one for Christmas. Um, and maybe you do have good memories of it. However, when someone sits in front of it, they can try out the, the 32X games, they can try out the Mega CD games, and they can try out a select few games which were for the 32X that came on CD. So it utilized the full tower. I'm really looking forward to trying those out later because I never have. And I never thought I'd have one of these setups for myself here in the cave until a box came along. This is how this whole journey started. And we'll begin with that box. We'd like to thank PCBWay.com for supporting our episode today. They aren't just about PCBs, although they do do a tremendous job of that. They also offer CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing, and injection molding. If you're creating, then PCBWay.com can help you bring your project to life. Get an instant quote now over at PCBWay.com, and we thank them for their support. Here is that box, hand delivered by my friend John. So this came about because his neighbor was having a clear out of their garage. Uh, they were putting some things on eBay. They know perfectly well what it was worth, but they were happy to sell me the contents of this box for 110 pounds. And I think that was a pretty good deal. Um, I don't know what that is in dollars, I'm afraid off the top of my head, but uh, let's say $140, something like that. There's no cables. It's just what we see in here. So um, I'm gonna pop this on the floor and then we can put it up on the desk. One thing at a time, starting with this. Every Tower of Power then starts with a Mega Drive. Released in Japan in 1988, we finally got it here in Europe in 1990, and the US got it a little bit before us in 1989. 16 bits was the name of the game. To highlight that this was a new generation of gaming, we had that gold lettering on the top, which, if I bring in the original Japanese console here on the left, is even more prominent. I actually think that original Japanese model is the better looking of the two, and I wish we had that style in the UK. It also promised intelligent terminal and high-grade multi-purpose use, which just makes me think of fluffy French phrases on aftershave bottles. What does it even mean? 
The original Japanese branding was also different to ours too for the Mega Drive name. Here's the logo on their console. And this is what we got on ours. The sliced font deemed more attractive to our market. Both I think are nice. I've got no real preference between the two of those, but it's interesting to see the difference. The Mega Drive had a fairly long life. It was discontinued in 1997 by Sega, although third parties such as Tectoy kept it alive for much, much longer than that. It's looked back on fondly in Europe, North America and Brazil, but it wasn't a huge success in its homeland of Japan, where the PC Engine and Super Famicom were favoured. What was inside it? Well, I'll open up ours and it seems to have a VA6 board inside, which is one of the later revisions. And the main workhorse of it is the Motorola 68000 CPU, running at around 7.6 MHz. This CPU is supported by custom chips, including the Video Display Processor, or VDP, on the left, and to the right is an I.O. chip. It's all very neat and tidy. Audio is interesting. It's managed by this Zilog Z80 CPU. Audio is its main duty, and that's controlling a YM2612 and a Texas Instruments Programmable Sound Generator, or PSG. The CPU gets 64K of RAM, the Z80 gets 8K to play with, and the games themselves are stored on the ROM chips in the cartridges. What this amounted to was a console aimed at bringing the games of Sega's System 16 arcade platform into the home and using their reputation and franchises from the arcades to leverage sales, as well as building on the market that they'd grown with their earlier Master System. And it did a good job of it. I certainly remember looking at it with envious eyes as a lowly Commodore Amiga owner. Let's take a look now at what else I've got in this magical box. A tower cannot be made by a console alone, so it's a good job that the Mega CD is also in our box, and that's a really tidy looking example. So what does this bring to our party? It was released in Japan in 1991, but we didn't get it here in Europe until 93, where it had a launch price in the UK of £270. The console itself was £190 on launch, so Sega expected you to spend nearly one and a half times as much again for an add-on. At that price, it was unsurprisingly a commercial failure, but in light of the competition releasing CD add-ons or announcing that they were working on them, Sega had to be seen to be keeping up. And this was the result. Regardless of the background of it, I think it looks incredible when paired up with the console. It's a gaming stack system with real visual presence. Inside the Mega CD is another CPU. It's a Motorola 68000 again, this time running at 12.5 MHz, and it's got a single speed CD-ROM drive, so it's pretty slow. It can transfer data at 150K a second, and it had its own custom graphics processor, which adds hardware scaling and rotation assistance, as well as a Mode 7 style effect, just like those seen in its competitor, the Super Nintendo. The Mega CD also added two extra sound channels for CD audio to stream direct from the CD, and eight more PCM sound channels. Multimedia madness had gripped Sega and us too, but this was gaming on a PC builder's budget, not really a home console budget. Back to our box. Amazingly, there is even more in it. Let's take a look. This Mega Drive 2 is included. So this was the cost reduced re-release of the console, came out in 1993. Changes to this model include the removal of the headphone jack, and a smaller video socket which had stereo sound output built in. If I pop the Model 2 on top of the one, you can see the size difference. No, stacking these does not amount to a tower of power, sorry. And yes, the Japanese Model 1 remains the best looking of them all. But for this episode, I really do want to focus in on the Mega Drive 1. It's fantastic that a Model 2 is included in the box, and there is one more thing in the box as well. It's a Mega CD 2. Yes, all of that. Two Mega Drives, two Mega CDs for £110, which just goes to show that bargains are still out there if you hunt beyond eBay. The Mega CD 2 includes all the functionality of the Model 1, along with the Mega Drive 2 stylings. In the present day, they are more available, they're cheaper to get hold of, and I've read that they're more reliable as well. I know which configuration I like, but perhaps your preference is the Model 2's side-by-side -side setup, and you don't even have to use a Mega Drive 2 with the Mega CD 2. You can slot the Mega Drive 1 right on this dock, and Sega even released a platform extension for the base of it to accommodate the full girth of the Model 1. Just in case you were wondering, I will be cleaning all these items up later, so don't worry, this is just how they arrived. Side by side then, well, you decide which is the better looking, the 1 or the 2. Funnily, it's the Model 1, which is the wider console, which ends up with a smaller footprint when it's combined with the CD. 
The Mega CD2 also lacks the ready and access lights on the front of the CD. I quite like those. But do leave a comment and let me know which you'd rather have. For the rest of the episode, we'll focus in on the Model 1. We're still missing something though for the full tower of power. And so, to complete it, I had to pop to my favourite retro gaming shop, Retro Games HQ, just down the road in Swindon. So, let's jump in the car. No, we're not going to go into the Thai massage spa on the right there, we're going to go into Holmes Music, a wonderful music and vinyl record shop in itself, but hidden away at the back is Pete and his retro goodies. Let's see what we can find. Set over two floors, it's very much a console shop, as are most retro game shops these days, but you will find a few cassette tapes hidden away. There's a huge amount of Nintendo gear from Rob the Robot through to Special Edition N64s and GameCubes, and there's a ton of loose handheld cartridges and plenty of boxed ones too. If you're looking for it, Pete has probably got it here somewhere and you can always contact him online first to check. As lovely as all this is, I'm in the wrong part of the shop for what I need to find. I'm looking for the 32X for my tower, and that's likely to be downstairs with all of the Mega Drive games and all of the Master System games here. And sure enough, it didn't take me long to find nestled in with the Sega Saturn items was an unboxed 32X. Pete does also have a boxed one, but I'm not too worried about the box. It came with the power supply, video cables, and an adapter collar, which would make it fit the Mega Drive too nicely, which is useful to have. I also spotted at the back of a cabinet, there was a nice boxed copy of a game, which I've read is one of the better ones to own for the 32X. Star Wars Arcade. I also picked up a couple of six button gamepads and was good to go. So thank you very much, Pete. And do say hello to him if you go down to Retro Games HQ, if you happen to be in Swindon. Right, do we just plug it in and play on it now? Well, it's always worth checking before powering it on. So I gave Mark Fix's stuff a call, who's worked on a lot of Mega CDs. Hello, Neil. So I've got this Sega Mega CD. Is there anything I should know before I turn it on? Yeah. Stop trying to set up fake video calls. It's not some scripted TV repair show. <laughs> yeah, thanks for that, Mark. We now have a 32X, released at the end of 1994. Its goal was to make the Mega Drive a 32-bit 3D powerhouse. It cost us £170 in the UK, $159 in the US, and the upgrade was designed to make your Mega Drive compete with the Jaguar, with the 3DO, with the Sony PlayStation, and with Sega's own Saturn. It introduces two more CPUs to our tower in the form of SH2 32-bit RISC processors, the same as were found in the Saturn, although these are running slower at 23 MHz each. There was more video RAM, it enabled 32,768 on-screen colors, and more sound channels. So when combined with the Mega CD in this stack, we have a total of 22 sound channels. <laughs> the 32X was released in America in the same month that Japan got the Sega Saturn. It was obviously a poor marketing move. Sega in Japan and other regions were out of sync and the price of a 32X was a sizable chunk of the purchase price of their own true next generation console. It was kind of a budget Saturn on a budget that would have cost you more than a Saturn having bought the sum of its parts. The total I paid for the 32X, the game, and two six-button pads was £276, taking our build price now to £386. But remember, we've also got a spare Mega Drive 2 and Mega CD 2 in that price. It's funny that these more premium 32-bit games for the platform came in paper packaging and not the plastic clamshell boxes that we were used to with Mega Drive games but it is nice to see that it supports two players and six button pads. Here are the pads that I picked up, and there is a difference between the two of them, but you have to look very closely to spot it. Each pad has a mode shoulder button, and that's to switch between three and six button modes, so you've got to be very careful not to knock that mid-game and lose half your moves. If we look at the back of the joy pads, this first one is a Sega Model 1653-50. It's a genuine pad with genuine finger funk built up in the screws. But if we look at the other one now, it's a repro. 
a retro bit branded pad, which is a licensed modern remake. It's a good one too, and you're lucky if you can find one. They seem to be out of stock everywhere I look, and it's just by chance that I accidentally picked one up at Retro Games HQ, thinking it was just a Sega original. But I'm happy with it. Add to the bench a stack of power supplies, including some extras for the Model 2, a bunch of video cables, and some capacitors, and we're nearly ready to try it all out. Of all the hardware on the bench, the one that concerns me the most is the Mega CD1. It really has a reputation for reliability problems and for leaky capacitors, so I wanted to get a look at that at the very least before putting power into it. Chatting to Mark, from his experience of fixing these, many have already leaked horribly and destroyed the boards. So I had my fingers crossed and I was hoping for the very best when he opened it up. There are multiple boards in the Mega CD, the main board, the power board, and the laser board. It's the surface mount capacitors on the main board which are prone to leak first in the system and deposit their electrolytic fluid all over the board. On closer inspection, we found that this has started to happen. Just. There's some crustiness forming around the capacitors and nearby components, and there is a very definite fishy smell present. But this is far from a very bad example. We've got really lucky here. Just next to this capacitor here, this chip is the system ROM. It's region locked, but you can add a socket and swap out this ROM if you're gonna modify it. But given that we can play different region Mega CD games in the cave, on the Laser Active, for example, I'm happy just to leave this as stock. Now, the problem with corrosion caused by leaking capacitors is that it can cause problems safely desoldering components. The goal is to remove them and clean the area without lifting the pads that the new capacitors will solder to. Now, Mark tried a variety of approaches on the very crustiest of capacitors, and um, he was concerned with the way it was behaving. Uh, would it delaminate the pad? Would it cause damage? we were a little bit worried about how much heat we were finding we had to apply. So for a couple of the capacitors, he adopted the approach of snipping them off very carefully with very sharp snips to minimize any stress caused to the pads. Then he removed the remnants of the capacitor and then was able to simply slide off the legs that remained on the pads with an iron. It's not a recommended method of recapping. Don't take this as advice, but it's a useful technique which Mark likes to use sometimes when absolutely necessary. And the result is an undamaged pad which we can reuse, so that's exactly what we want. As an aside, if your Mega CD has been ruined by leaking caps, there are now brand new recreations of the boards inside being developed by Kosam with the help of Chrissy and Simon, also known as Ergon. I'll pop the links in the video descriptions and I'll update them as these boards become available to help you out. So all is not lost. If you have a Mega CD that looks like it's just been destroyed by leaking capacitors, there is now hope. Meanwhile, lots of cleaning has taken place around the leaked capacitors. And this one here, this is far better behaved. This is what we want. It's obviously leaked less or there's been less corrosion going on around it because it lifts right off with Mark's heated tweezers. That's how they should come off. It should be that easy. There's a couple of through hole capacitors on the board too, which we'll replace just because we can. We've got it out, we might as well. And we did decide to test them just to see how they were and they measured just fine. So we didn't need to replace them, but there you go, we have done. In go the new capacitors. It's not a terribly large job this, but the three millimeter diameter capacitors can be a bit fiddly to work with when you're as ham fisted as us. With those all done, we can pop the board back in, screw it all together, and finally take this bad boy for a spin. And I'm not talking about Mark.
So with those fishy caps taken care of, we're ready to test out some games on this. There are more capacitors to change on the Mega CD. I just didn't want to turn this whole episode into a recapping episode. So I'll talk about that a bit later, what we need to change and why we need to do it. And I will get on with doing that. But there are games to be played. It also needs a wipe down. I'll do that um, after I've tested it out because I'm desperate to try this thing. And um, there's the small matter of wiring it up. Now this is a games console, a games console with lots of upgrades. And when these upgrades are added, it goes from being the pull out the box, plug and play solution that a games console should be into a bit of a, a mess of spaghetti wiring. Let me show you how all this works back here. First of all, there's power to deal with. And believe it or not, there's three power inputs, the 32X, the uh, Mega Drive and the Mega CD. Two of them have a negative polarity in the center. One has positive polarity, which means if you accidentally plug one, the wrong cable into the wrong thing, you are at risk of doing irreversible damage to it. So we've got to be very careful about what we put where. The 32X is center positive, and that's this one. This is an original power supply, so put that in there. And then the Mega Drive one and the Mega CD both have center negative. And we'll pop those into the Mega Drive and the Mega CD. And then I just want you to take a look at the plugs here. So I've got an original Sega power adapter in here. There it is, that's the original one. And then these are a couple of modern replacements. Notice how chunky it is. A Woolwort, as I think you call it in the US. Sega actually produced their own power strip, Sega branded power strip for the Tower of Power because you wouldn't fit the originals next to each other on a standard um, plug socket. And it costs over a hundred pounds for a collector to get one now, which is just madness. Um, you could just spread them out so that they would all fit together, even original ones. Absolute madness. Anyway, there you go. Three power supplies to get this console going. Now we need to hook up the video. So we'll start with the Mega Drive itself. So we're using the RGB output where our lovely Blast Process 2D graphics are spat out. Comes out there. This cable also has a three and a half mil stereo jack on it, a breakout cable. What we do with that is we plug it into the headphone socket and on the headphone socket on the front of the Mega Drive, we get our Mega CD audio and our Mega Drive audio is mixed in there. So it comes up and it joins our video and goes down the same cable. Um, if you were just using a Mega CD normally and according to the manual, you're supposed to run a three and a half mil jack from the headphone socket. So you're still coming out the front of the Mega Drive. It's pretty janky. And you're supposed to go in the three and a half mil mixing port here, and then you get left and right phono outputs to go wherever you want. So that's, that's a neater way of doing it, I guess, if you're going into um, a stack system or something that uses phono ports. But as you're getting the mix down audio anyway, on the headphone jack, you might as well just use that. So we've got our audio and our video on our cable here. This cable um, needs to be joined up with a smaller cable of the type that you would get with a Mega Drive 2, actually, for your video. And then that feeds into the 32X up here. So as our 3D processing is done here, it takes our 2D video, does its 3D processing and overlays it onto the uh, 2D video and then spits it combined out. A bit like us PC owners who used to have a 3D Voodoo graphics card, you would have to daisy chain it up to your 2D graphics card and then it would spit out the combined video. That's exactly what's happening here. So the 32X is the final place where the video is spat out. If I can get that in, there we go. And that's just going to our SCART socket on our television. Um, I think that's everything. Yeah. Three power supplies, uh, one three and a half mil jack and three video cables. And we're all ready to go and test it out. I think that's right anyway. Just double check the wires, make sure I'm not gonna blow anything up. Okay, we're good. Let's turn it on. And that's the Mega CD splash screen. It's, um, it's a thing, it's certainly a splash screen of its time. I quite like it. 1993 version one, it says at the top right hand side. Finally, let's try out some games then. Uh, we're gonna skip the Mega Drive games. I think we all know what stock Mega Drive games are like. We really wanna see the Mega CD games, Mega CD games with 32X enhancements and the 32X games. First question is, how do you get a CD game in there when there's no eject button? Uh, well, the answer is you press reset. Of course you press reset on the Mega Drive and the tray slides open. Let me put the game in. And then to close it, we press start on the joypad. And then the game should load up. Let's see what it's got to offer. It's 
It's Night Trap, of course, perhaps the most well-known Sega Mega CD game. It's a full-motion video game starring Dana Plato, who appeared in the US sitcom Different Strokes, and whose life would end quite tragically in 1999. What's the game all about? Well, this guy knows. Your mission? Protect those girls from whatever happened to the last ones. Now listen up. Last night, one of our agents got into the house and found some kind of weird security system. Hidden cameras in almost every room and a series of traps. Our agent spliced an override into the security system, allowing you to have control of the cameras and the traps with this remote unit. Use the traps to capture anyone or anything that endangers the lives of those girls. But make sure you don't trap someone you should be protecting. The game comprises of eight rooms and different videos play out in those rooms. Your job is to visit the rooms at the right time and press a button at the right time to capture the intruders. It's basically channel hopping with the memory game Simon thrown in. And as simple as that sounds, it's actually a novel way of trying to eke some gameplay out of the otherwise very linear format that is video. A challenge many game developers of the time were trying to overcome before they realized video is best used to supplement gameplay. I'm not saying it's an incredibly playable game, just that it's a novel approach. This 1992 release we're watching is using the Mega Drive and the Mega CD, but there was a later 1995 re-release for the 32X. So let's see the difference. And this, is Kelly. this is the 1992 Mega CD version. She'll be arriving with the rest of the girls. I'm putting her life and the lives of those other girls in your hands, so don't even think of messing up. This is my attack squad, and that's Kelly, one of my best undercover agents. She'll be arriving with the rest of the girls. I'm putting her life and the lives of those other girls in your hands. Don't even think of messing up. Well, the acting hasn't got any better, but the video is certainly enhanced. The 32X is providing help to achieve this, but I still wouldn't say that it's acting as an FMV module of the quality scene in, say, the Philips CDI or the Amiga CD32. Those FMV modules, which did come at an extra cost, do do a much better job of playing video CDs back smoothly and with a greater color depth. The result, however, is a more enjoyable version of the game, but it doesn't really feel like it's given us everything this hardware has to offer. It's an FMV game, and by 1995, that's feeling dated regardless of how good the video looks. Glad we must visit the Ogs tonight. I'd much rather stay here and enjoy our new guests. <laughs> <laughs> Radical dude, we go on in. Which way, ma? From the same creators came Corpse Killer in 1994, also on the Mega CD and then with a 32X enhanced version later released, which we're watching now. This is a little bit more fun than Night Trap in that it combines video with light gun support to create an on rails shooting game. I'm playing it here quite badly with the joypad. It's cheesy, and it amounts to a game of Operation Wolf with zombie skateboarders hurling themselves at you. But it's more of a game than Night Trap. You'd still be struggling to justify the cost of your Tower of Power based on this though, so I think we need to move away from video-based games and see what else it can do. A Mega CD game now, and we can always rely on Sega's mascot to help us out. Sonic CD from 1993 is a whole new Sonic game that's enhanced by the Mega CD's hardware. It's got a really lovely CD-based soundtrack, although that single-speed CD-ROM does mean that you get a noticeable gap between songs, which is a little jarring. It also has bonus stages which make use of the extra video hardware, so that Mode 7 style effect we mentioned earlier, you can see that here in the bonus stage. This effect was also used in other games like Thunderhawk, and it would be a welcome addition to Mega Drive gamers who looked enviously at their Super Nintendo friends who were playing Mario Kart, F-Zero, and Pilot Wings, and other games that used Mode 7. We've tried some Mega CD games and Mega CD games with 32X support, let's try a 32X cartridge now. 
1992, Virtua Racing hit the arcades and its silky smooth 3D graphics turned our heads away from the 2D sprite scaling based racers. The 32X got a version of this game in 1994 when it was a launch title with the hardware. And it really was the ideal game to show it off. It clips along at 20 frames per second making it perfectly playable but not as smooth as the arcade. The draw distance is quite short and compromises have been made to bring it into the home but I think it's an impressive feat. That being said, Sega also released this for the stock Mega Drive with the addition of the SVP or Sega Virtua Processor, an extra chip in the game cartridge itself. The result of that was the game cost £70 or $100 in the US to cover the cost of that chip, and it certainly wasn't as good as the 32X version, but it was impressive nonetheless. In the UK we'd get the 32X version in 1995. In this year we could see a Mega Drive release, a 32X release and a Sega Saturn version of the game. The latter being vastly superior and an advert for why you should probably put your money towards the Saturn. The biggest problem for the Tower of Power was quite simply timing. And the same could be said of Virtua Fighter, which is another very playable game which shows us what the 32X can do. But Virtua Fighter was released on the Sega Saturn in November of 1994 in Japan, and it was over a year later before we got it on the 32X here in Europe. It was an inferior version of a game on a previous generation's console, although some reviewers did compliment bug fixes which had been applied since the Sega Saturn's version. It is a good game though and not to be skipped, and an SVP enhanced version of it for the stock Mega Drive was planned but then cancelled to become part of the Sega Saturn's launch lineup. The same thing happened with Daytona USA. Virtua Fighter and Racing I get, but the heavily texture mapped 3D models of Daytona would surely have never been able to make it on the 32X. Even the Sega Saturn struggled with that one. An absolutely huge game which owes a lot of its success to the Mega Drive is FIFA Soccer, which I remember bursting into 3D on the very expensive 3DO console in 1994. It combined a 3D environment with 2D sprites, and that's what we see on the 32X too. The view can be changed to your taste, and you can enjoy FIFA in the third dimension in a way that wasn't available on stock Mega Drives. However, unlike the 3DO, this isn't 1994. The 32X got FIFA 96. So it's that question of timing again. Direct comparisons therefore could be made on the PlayStation, on the Saturn and on the PC, all of which were superior versions of the game and they utilised the CD-ROM's capacity to have commentary in game. On the 32X, we just get this shout if a goal is scored. It's once again admirable that the platform was getting game releases for it at this time and it is playable, although it's still a period of FIFA where I felt that the pace of Kickoff 2 or Sensible Soccer were a lot more fun to play. I'm perhaps not painting the most positive picture so far, but I was finding fun in the system, and Star Wars Arcade was especially enjoyable. This was a launch title for the 32X's release and an exclusive one to the platform, so even Sega Saturn owners couldn't play this one. It's a spiritual successor to Atari's 1983 wireframe arcade game, and this version features filled polygons and finds you intercepting TIE fighters and making a run on the Death Star. It also supports two players, so player two can act as a second gunner in the same ship for cooperative play. The emptiness of space has always lent itself well to low polygon gaming, and it does so again here, maintaining a nice frame rate and it's really good fun gameplay. The 32X was also used to enhance 2D games and this really does help the system to hit a sweet spot. 
Games like Mortal Kombat and Afterburner Complete are elevated beyond the capabilities we've come to expect from a stock Mega Drive and become near arcade perfect ports. The same applies to NBA Jam, WrestleMania and others. As a retro gamer it's great to go back and enjoy these games and I think you'd get a huge amount of pleasure out of them at the time too. Although even some of these could have been a little bit better. Mortal Kombat 2 has been patched in the modern day to make it an even more complete and more arcade perfect port and there's a link to that in the video description. But what about Doom? The killer game that set PC gaming alight in 1993. Well this game on the 32X is a story of two halves. Or was that FIFA? Doom came to the 32X in November of 1994. It was stripped back, it lacked the final episode and some of the maps were cut down. Some of the enemies were completely removed. The view is reduced to increase the frame rate and the resolution isn't particularly clear. But that being said it's completely playable at a fairly acceptable frame rate. Quite a feat really you would think. But it turns out so much more was possible and it would take nearly 30 years to prove that point. This is Doom Resurrection. It's been around for a couple of years now but the latest release has just arrived and the beauty of this game is that it uses the full tower of power. It uses both of the SH2 CPUs in the 32X to spread that rendering load, something the original didn't do. It offloads sound mixing to the Mega CD hardware, it increases the resolution and it restores all of the maps and missing enemies. It even adds split screen multiplayer and link up play and it has Sega mouse support for good measure. This is everything Doom should have been for the 32X and it's banging on every part of the Tower of Power to show us what it can do. It is an astonishingly good port of the game and that's something I'd never thought I'd say about Doom on a Mega Drive. You'd be happy with this performance on your 486 PC. Here's a side by side comparison for good measure. On the left is the retail release, on the right is the modern patched version. And as this was based on the Jaguar source code originally, it makes you wonder what else the Tower of Power is capable of when used in this way. And the difference between those Doom ports is really the takeaway story that I got from this Tower of Power from playing with it. The Mega CD, it came out in good time in Japan and cashed in on the multimedia hype of the day, but it took two years to get to us in the UK by which point we were looking towards games that had a bit more playability than the things that FMV had to offer. FMV complemented games well but ultimately this was still a 16-bit system just with the capacity of a CD. And then there was the 32X which just felt like a kind of misguided misunderstanding between two divisions of Sega when actually they should have all been unified and focused on the launch of the Sega Saturn to take on the Sony PlayStation. An unknown quantity at that point as Sony hadn't entered the market and Sega got quite a shock from that. And that's why it was so nice when this version of Doom was released. Uh, version 3 of this patched version of Doom, it's been around for a while but this new version 3 came out while I was filming it was very timely um, its release and it just gave me a sense of what was possible when the full stack was used without the pressures of release dates and budgets and trying to rush something out for Christmas back in 1994. This was just somebody using their experience using modern development tools and showing us what's possible when you use the whole stack. And it makes me think what else is possible? That Doom port was based on Jaguar source code would it be possible to run say the Jaguar version of Alien vs Predator? Could you port that across to the Tower of Power? What else could you do with it? Hopefully there's an appetite out there to do more ports and to show us more about what this is capable of and um, it can become more than just that thing that we thought we wanted and we became we were glad that we didn't get um, looking back on it and seeing the failure that it was and then began to lust after as we became retro game collectors. Yeah it's a really interesting one and it's great to see people still developing for it. As I said I didn't want to turn this episode into a recapping episode so the coffee's on. Uh, I've had a chat again with the guys who created those replacement Sega Mega CD PCBs 
they know the system inside out. And they've advised me that while the leaky SMD caps that we replaced are a good catch and needed to be done, there are a few more that should be swapped out as a necessity in the name of preventative maintenance. The three 100 microfarad caps on the subboard, for example, they insist I should absolutely do. And that's all in the name of making sure this lasts and can be enjoyed here. And then I'll turn my attention to the Mega Drive 2 and check that over as well. I did, of course, give it a good wipe down and a clean, so um, you don't worry about touching it if you come here to have a go on it. And it's found pride of place in the hands-on exhibition area. I just need to do a bit of signage to tell people about it who perhaps haven't seen this video, and then they can enjoy it. There's much more to learn about the system. There are many more games to play, which I haven't mentioned. I just wanted to choose a spectrum of games to show you that highlighted different capabilities of the system. If you've got any recommendations for me, do let me know. Uh, and I'll go and try those out. And if you want to come and try it out for yourself, head over to retrocollective.co.uk when you can see when I open up the cave and you can get a ticket to come and hang out and challenge me to a deathmatch, if you like, on Doom. Thank you as always for taking the time to watch. If you'd like to support what we do here, head over to patreon.com forward slash rmcretro where all of your support is hugely appreciated. And I'll see you next time. Take care, bye-bye.